So good morning, everybody. Um, it is with great honor and privilege that uh, we get to have a guest speaker today that is true as far as I'm concerned. Uh, a lot of people believe is a walking legend to have him here in front of you. Um, this man, he's the owner of music, uh, Sonia School of Music. Um, it was the first music conservatory ever opened up by a woman in 1948 in Los Angeles, and that was his mother, the late great Dolores Rhodes. Um, he has taken over that. He has, um, he's a classical musician, uh, by far one of the best classical musicians uh, to date, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he's working on his fifth CD, and he also sings in a band that travels the world, and uh, that band, he honors his brother, Randy Rhodes. Um, who wrote some of the best metal songs in all uh, music history, including Crazy Train, uh, Goodbye Romance, and my personal favorite, Diary of a Mad Men. But um, anyway, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Kelly Rhodes. Thank you. Yeah, at this time, we do want to invite all of our guest speakers to please start the presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, and enjoy career day. All right. I remember career day when I was in high school. Everybody's father came and, and said what they did, even if they were super boring, like they were insurance salesmen. And they kind of uh, pretty much based it on what people's fathers did. And the fathers came and they gave the career day. I guess it's a little bit different um, today because I noticed down in the reception area there was a lot of very official looking people. Um, the music business uh, is a very uh, wide and, and, and huge thing. So what I've decided to do is I've decided to base what I'm going to tell you on a fictitious band. We're going to pretend that we're going to follow a band's progress from when it first gets together up until it reaches a certain point of stardom that the band would, would become world, world known for. Or in this case, an artist. It could be an artist or it could be a whole band. And during their journey, we're going to talk about the different aspects of the music business. All right. So before the band even gets going, there's the instructional part of the music business. This is where people learn their craft. Bass player has to take lessons so he can play bass. The drummer has to take lessons so he can drum. The singer has to take lessons so he can sing. Not everybody does this. A lot of people are self-taught. A lot of people never get any better either. But here's the deal. Before we even get off the ground, we've got one important aspect of the music business, which I'm very familiar with because I come from a family that started a music school shortly after World War II. And I run that school now. So we've got the instructional part of the music business, and then we've got a couple of guys, much like yourselves, that get together at school, and it's always invariably this conversation. I like this band. Then the, the, the other guy will go, I like that band too. They're great. And they'll bond over some of the music that they like. Pretty soon the conversation goes like this. Well, I actually play guitar. I take lessons at Musonia School of Music. Wow, I'm a drummer and I'm looking for a teacher. So these guys, now they're not just friends anymore, they're potential bandmates. So they get together and now they've got to look for two other people. They've got to find a singer and then they have to find um, a bass player. Okay, so maybe somebody's friend knows of a friend, that's how most of the people that I knew growing up and performing in bands, usually what happens is it starts with two and then other friends say they know somebody. Somebody always knows somebody. And what happens 
is they pull everybody together and now they have a band. Okay, welcome to the second aspect of the music business. They have to have instruments. So now we've got instruction and then once everybody's together, we have got the uh, sideline of instruments. They have to go buy instruments. So there's another aspect right there. Okay, thirdly, they have to find a place to rehearse. So now you have rehearsal facilities. Rehearsal facilities can run the gamut between somebody's bedroom or garage, which usually doesn't last for too long because the parents can't stand the noise any longer and they have to find a place to rehearse. So they go to a full-on rehearsal facility. If you're able to find one these days for 30 an hour, that's good. Usually it's more, and what they'll do is they'll make you block time. So you can't just rehearse there for 45 minutes. You have to rehearse for a three-hour block of time. Okay? So they play together. The band works out. And on down the line, now they want to start playing out. Okay, this is real important. A band shouldn't play out until they already can get people to go to a party, a birthday party, a backyard thing, uh, maybe a little deal in a bar or something like that. You have to build a following from the ground up. Nobody gets out there and plays and they're so amazing that all of a sudden 500 people magically show up because they're so good. They have to build a groundswell. So, what happens is they start playing out. Welcome to the third aspect of the music business. Club owners and promoters. Something I could write a book about. In fact, I could write a trilogy. And that's a breed all to themselves. These are people that give the musicians a forum. They give them a platform. They get a place to actually start playing. Now, this fictitious, oh look at dessert, how kind. Um, here's the deal. A lot of bands don't make it past this stage. This is the jumping off period for a lot of bands. They don't make it past this. But the ones that do, the ones that do, usually procure either a manager or a booking agent. Okay. A lot of people think they're the same thing. They are not. It's actually against the law in California for a manager to book gigs. That's what uh, an artistic talent agent does. All right. People also think that when they need a manager for the band, which is usually when they get tired of making phone calls and they want someone else to do it, they actually think that they go out and they look for a manager like you look for shoes. Uh-uh. Usually a manager will come to you. What they do is they, they have an idea of what's going to be successful. And they come after you. They hear a buzz. What happens is they hear about you. And they hear that your band is really good. You're drawing crowds. You've got great tunes. People, people love you. Um, and they'll go check you out. They'll check you out. And if they think that, if they smell money, they'll approach you. Now, an agent would work very much uh, the same way because what happens is they have an idea of what kind of shows they're going to book and what size venues they're going to book them in and they can tell by looking at you if you would your band if you would be good for certain shows so now you've met an agent maybe you've even run into somebody who says they want to manage you this is one thing that's real important. The first people that approach you are usually fanagers, not managers. What's a fanager? A fanager is somebody who has a construction job or maybe is a dentist and they want to get into the music business. So what they do is they find a band and they pay for everything for a while until a real manager comes along. And when a real manager comes along, if the band is smart, they get rid of the manager and they go with the manager. All right. Now we come into the uh, fourth stage of the music business. You're booked into clubs. You're
trying to get out of town, which is a really good strategy, when you become involved in a band, um, and this was something that I thought too, uh, you want to play every place in your local vicinity. You want to play, uh, if you're in California, you want to play the whiskey, you want to play, uh, you know, you want to play the troubadour, you want to, you want to play the local places, Paladinos out in, in Reseda. Um, this is not a good strategy. When you put a band together, the best thing to do actually is to play as far out of town as you can get bookings. Why? Because people in town, they already have an idea about you. But if you go and you start in the East Coast and work your way back, those people in the mid part of the country, they're hearing about you and looking at your shows while you're actually doing them and going back to your home base. So that's a good strategy to work out of town and then to work back in. Now you come to the fourth, you got to have a support group, okay? Uh, you have to have a system of uh, roadies, a crew, people that is, can travel with your band, and usually what's advisable is you need what's called a front house engineer. A front house engineer controls your sound. If you don't have one, you're going to sound different in each place you play. And since the acoustic qualities, dimensions of the room, and the different <coughs> sizes of rooms make a huge difference on the way the band sounds, it makes sense to travel with a front house engineer. Don't confuse that with the person who engineers recording sessions. That's a different kind of engineer. Okay, now the band's traveling, you've got a crew in place, everything is going along pretty good. Now we go into the fifth phase of the music business, and this is what everybody's aiming for. This is the brass ring. You get signed. Whoa, you get a recording contract, okay? That means all the money that they give you to put on your show, to buy stage clothes, to rent a tour bus, which is not cheap, by the way. They're usually about $40,000 when you go on tour. When you see a tour bus, that's what they pay. All right, so the record company gives you money so that you can put your show on and travel around and go ahead and start writing music that's going to be recorded. What they don't tell you is it's all to be paid back to the record company. All it is is an advance on your royalties. Okay? That means you have to actually pay that money back. Right. So, here's, here's what happens next if the band is successful. You go into the studio and you start recording. Okay. This enters another phase of the music business, and that's recording and reproduction. What that means is you need people to engineer and to help you manufacture your music. I'll tell you the two things that people stick with the most in their career. Usually people will stick with managers if they're doing a good job. They'll stick with them for a long, long, long time. And they'll also stick with an engineer for a real long time. Because that is a very important relationship. The engineer has to kind of know you and your sound and what you're trying to do just about as much as you do yourself. And sometimes they, they keep you from making mistakes and doing too much. And so an engineer is very, very, very important. A lot of engineers are producers, but they don't necessarily have to produce. Sometimes there's people that only produce. You might have heard of a band called Def Leppard. Before they ran into engineer Mutt Lang, they did good music, but not great music. When they ran into Mutt Lang, everything changed and their records started selling in the millions instead of the thousands. Okay, so here we go. You've already recorded. Uh, let's just say that people really liked it, okay? They really liked it. There's a joke in the music business that the only person making money is Taylor Swift. That's not true, but the reason they say that is because she sells so many records. So many records. 
Um, you've got now a point where the band is known all over the world. And they made a record, maybe they made two. They're very, very successful and they're known all over the world. Well, now, now we come into even another phase of the music business, but these people that are coming into the phase now, they're not necessarily, they don't do musical things for the band. They uh, work alongside the band. What you have to have is you have to have an accountant. Uh, by this stage of the game, you would need a manager, and actually, you need another accountant to watch the account. And so you've got a little bit of a behind the scenes support group, accountants, managers. You sign to an agency so you can tour, all right? Now, if you're really, really successful and people really like your band a real lot, uh, you're going to need somebody that works like a personal assistant. You have way, way, way more than you can do as just one person. You have to have a person that does for you what uh, people do with their assistants, valets, whatever you want to call them. Um, there's so many things that happen. You get called to do all kinds of charity work and things like that, and people want to know if you can do this TV show, they want to know if you can do that TV show, would you be interested in doing this ad? Here's this company that makes uh, different clothes, they want you to endorse their clothes. Actually, I got this shirt for free, because I got my picture taken playing piano, wearing this shirt, never heard from those people again, but whatever. I got a shirt, they got a picture, I guess everybody's happy. So, the thing is, is um, uh, now we've talked about five or six different related things, and it's all in the music industry. Somebody that you, is an engineer in a recording studio, they're in the music industry. Somebody that works for the record company that makes sure that your product is available, they're in the music industry. They're in the music industry, but they don't actually get up on stage and play. All right, okay. Now, that's basically not everything, but it's basically the key points of some of the interrelated people in a uh, situation where music is made. But what I didn't mention to you is um, there's a lot of people that reproduce and recreate old music. They're in the music industry too. They do orchestrations and have perhaps little groups of musicians that play on period piece instruments, okay? They're in the music industry. But what they're doing is they're taking a piece by Haydn or Beethoven and they're putting it with a string quartet or a small, I'm, I work in a situation where we have a bunch of guitar players and they recreate a piece of music. They all play the same thing and they're acoustic. You don't have wires and microphones they just play it acoustic. So you have some situations that do specialty. In the 1950s, there was real popular for record companies to put out music that was music from around the world, what Romanian folk songs sounded like, uh, a traditional um, Mexican music, uh, that type of thing. Actually, it was real popular in the 50s. People sold a lot of records with that. It's not so popular anymore. So you do have some uh, different uh, specialty areas that I'm not mentioning because they're, they don't fit the main scheme. The main scheme is the two guys getting together, finding two other guys, and then going through the whole gamut of the different um, things that I told you about, the different ways that people interrelate to uh, the music business. And they are, because they do that, they are in the, the, the music business. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm supposed to leave some time in case you guys want to ask me questions or whatever. So let's, it's after 10. Is it appropriate to yep. do that now, yep, Edward? It's perfect. Is that good? Yep. Okay. So, do you have any questions? Do you have any comments? At none. Okay, that's not good. Because I can't think of anything else. 
you with the beard. <laughs> so uh, with the advent of Spotify, Pandora, and these other online services for uh, young musicians that want to get their music out there, um, do you recommend you know uh, going that route, getting their music, even if they're not making money on that music? Um, should they stick with YouTube? Should they kind of do their own production to just get their, their music out there? Would I do that? No. No. Do I think it's a good idea for other people to do it? Yes. And here's why. That's the technology at hand. Okay? We're past the time that we go down to the record company, the record store, the mom and pop record store. There used to be so many of them. So many of them. We're past the time where somebody goes down there and buys the newest release from their favorite band. They don't do it that way anymore. Now, as you mentioned, you have Spotify, you have all this different music. Uh, uh, I, I hear that music comes out of the clouds now. Um, uh, things like that, I, I, I don't actually um, take part in myself, and here's why. Number one, when I put out a CD, I want people to buy the whole CD. I have put that CD out in a way that tells a story. For somebody to try to buy that uh, online and only download one or two songs makes as much sense to me as going to the library and ripping out a chapter of a book and checking that out. That just doesn't, it's something that I want people to have. I want them to have the entire work, the entire record. I just slaved for two years to put the record together, and uh, I want them to have the whole story. If they choose to only listen to one song, that's their prerogative. So actually for me, that model doesn't work, okay? But number one, I'm old, and number two, um, I'm able to sell my music without doing that. Do I think it's a good idea for a new band? Yeah, because that's the playing field now, <laughs> okay? But I really think it completely sucks that you put music out and somebody can just download it for free and you, you, you get nothing or very little from it. That's really too bad. The classic example of when record companies were going on all eight cylinders was in the 1970s. And I know this because after I went to college for about 13 minutes, I decided to go to work and I got a really good opportunity to go and work at Capitol Records. I was a mailboy in that big, vast, sinful tower that you see when you go down the 101. Best job I ever had in my life. It was fantastic. Anyway, that was a true model for record companies back in those days, way before the internet, way before people got music from Clouds and Spotify and CD Baby and other people's babies and whatever. So that was really, really a great time. In the, in, the, in, in the recording industry and, and making, you know, making records. It's changed, and there's nothing you can do once it changes. It's amazing to me that people buy vinyl. I thought that was done. I thought that was done. I thought we were, we were gonna go cassettes, then CDs, then whatever comes next. But actually, that's a rare trend. People actually went backwards and bought something that at one time was the state of the art. So that really did uh, uh, surprise me. Okay, do we have any more? Oh, good. He spawned a little movement here. How about you in the hood? Um, I know nowadays a lot of people like to produce digitally and not usually a lot of instruments like most yeah. people used to. Do you consider them musicians or not? Are you talking about people that are using computers and not actually making music? Here's what the, here, this is a good question. I'd like you to ask me that. This is what the, what's important, the end result. The end result. If you, somebody does music that way and people really like it and it catches on, then that was a good idea. Okay? But I, this has to be said, it has to be prefaced to really fully answer your question. Whereas doing it digitally affords incredible opportunities such as in editing, it really, in a way, if you're a purist, it cheats a little bit. There's some people that like to still use 2HK, okay? The way that it was done back in the old days. 
And some people really prefer to record that way. They like it. They like it. They think that it's more organic. They actually feel that that's the way you should record music. I really have a lot to say for Pro Tools and stuff like that because I write the music and I don't want to spend hours in an expensive recording studio editing and trying to splice in a third or fourth piano part when with Pro Tools, I can do that in a couple of minutes. It's so cool. I played the performance. It's my music. If there's a way, if there's a system that can put that in there instantaneously, I'll go for it. But these people that are making music, if it's something that people really like, uh, my answer is, is more power to you. Whatever. Whatever. Whatever works. Whatever produces the result that you want. Now i got to say one more thing right here. One of the greatest things about the internet is uh, anybody and everybody can make a project, can make a CD, and put it out. One of the bad things about that is everybody can make a CD <laughs> and do a project and put it out. Record companies used to be filters. We'll sign this band. They're called The Cars. They're from Boston. They're pretty good. Their music's pretty good. They deserve to be signed. Here you've got 150 bands waiting in line, and their stuff goes from absolute garbage to just total immature stuff. That is what a record company used to do. They used to filter it out. They had people that knew what would sell. Those people are called A&R people. That stands for Artists and Repertoire. And once they signed a band, they had a lot to say about what that band records. Because they knew what the pulse of the public is. So it's great everybody can make a CD. I did, Edward and I, we can make a CD this afternoon. <laughs> then we, we have a whole project. You know? That's great. Put it on the internet. With the other 150,000 CDs that were made that afternoon. You get my point? So that's one thing that's a curse, but it's also a blessing. You have your hand up. Uh, what's your take on getting a four-year degree in music? All right, good question. Very good. Are you considering that? Yes. Okay, good. It's always really, really good to study music. You need to know how to read music. If I have a session with two cellists that are from Czechoslovakia, a violist from France, and three violinists, say, from Mexico, how are we going to talk to each other? I don't know how to speak, though. Well, actually, I do know how to speak Spanish, so I can only talk to one of them. But the rest of them, I wouldn't know how to talk to, okay? You don't need that. You don't need talking. You don't need talking. All you do is you put the music in front of you, you look at the chart, and you know what you're doing. You might have somebody that kind of leads the whole thing, like a conductor or an arranger, but the music is right there. You all studied the notes. You all know how to read the notes. That's just like you reading English. So it's very, very, very important. Also, if you're talking about a four-year music course in a very prestigious school, like Juilliard uh, or one of the Berkeley School of Music, uh, it can help because people look at that and they see where you went and it can kind of influence uh, the way that you're perceived. If you want to get a job teaching music, it's essential. You can't do it any other way. You have to do it that way. If you want to be in a band, well, you could probably talk to people in bands and a lot of them, you know, they really don't read music. They should, but they don't. So what are you going to do? A lot of successful bands that sell millions of records. But it's always advisable to do it that way. Don't do it that way just because you want to get in a band, but you should do it that way because you should really know your craft. You need to know how to write, to read music, and you need to know a certain amount about theory and harmony. And that's what you learn in a four-year music course. The best schools for that, unless you're going to go to a private music school, would be USC and UCLA. My, my mom went to UCLA, as did my father, and they got excellent educations in music. And that's where they got their degrees. So I actually think it's a, an asset, and I think that that's what you should do. Do you need to do it to be in a band? No. 
but you should do it. You should do it. I have multiple people who uh, go through, um, who are music teachers and hold multiple jobs, those who don't necessarily want to become famous. Well, say that again, I didn't hear you. Like those the people who work in the music industry who don't necessarily want to be in band to become famous, they work a teacher or director, they work multiple jobs. Well, that's what I was trying to underscore by my little speech earlier that there's a lot of people that are involved in the music industry that don't actually get up on the stage yeah. and play, right? So that's kind of a real important thing. I forgot who said this. A friend of mine told me it the other day. And it's just a reminder that in about seven minutes, we will be switching to another uh -oh. session. So you have seven minutes to finish the session. Okay, so this is real important. I forgot who said this, but it was somebody very profound. It might have been Dylan, Bob Dylan. It might have been John, uh, uh, that, that guy Tom Waits. I'm not sure. It might, might not have been either of them. I wasn't paying attention. But this is what they said. This is a quote. Everybody should be famous and successful so they can see how unimportant that is. Okay? What that means is if you think if you think you want to get in a band just so you can be rich and successful, the chances are almost 100% that that won't happen, okay? I've worked with some of the finest musicians on the planet, okay? And the ones that are real successful, including my dearly departed little brother, they did not do that to make a bunch of money or to get girls or just to chase success for the reason of chasing success? No, 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 no. The people that really do end up being successful, they have to do what they're doing. Even if they make no money, even if they have no place to live, they're gonna be sitting someplace with no shoes on playing guitar, because they have to do it. They absolutely have to do it. I absolutely have to play piano and compose classical music. I guess I'm a little bit lucky, because some of it sells, if you go to Amoeba Records, you go down in the back of the thing, and you go to the classic records, and there's Rishi and blah, 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 Rhodes. Oh, whoa, my own little uh, section, my own section of my records sell there at Amoeba. So, and other stores too. So I would say that, that if you absolutely have to do it, if you're not doing it, you're dreaming about it. If you're not dreaming about it, you're talking about it to somebody. You absolutely have to do it, okay? You're going to do it. But if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, if you think you're going to be rich and successful and be like the Beatles and blah, 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 it's not going to work out the way you think. It never does. It never works out the way you think it's going to work out. Never, never. When I was a little kid, I had this weird feeling. I didn't know why I had it. I felt that one day people would be really interested in our school. I felt that one day people that were real well known and very famous would go to that school just to see that school. And I had no reason to think that then. But you know what? It came true. What I didn't know was my road to becoming into the music business and the road that my brother took that was so tragically cut short. Thank God I didn't know about that stuff. That would have driven me crazy. But it was something that I felt when I was a little tiny kid. I felt this place is going to be important one day. Well, it used to be up there. Anyway, um, this place is going to be important. This place is going to be some place that people want to go to, to look at, to see what we did. And uh, it's our 69th year. We uh, will be enjoying 70 years of operation this time next year. I have some little flyers in case somebody's interested, they can come up and get one from me. But don't take one unless you're really interested in um, learning a musical instrument because that's what we're really trying to attract. Um, our attendance is at a 69 year low, I hate to admit, but it is the nature of how things are right now. We're starving for students. Your teacher used to study at our school. We're known all over the world. We're a great music school. We have the very best teachers, but it's 2017. So there's other things people think that they can do. Going to Skype is not the best way to learn an instrument because the teacher can't see the whole body. 
Is the foot doing the right thing? If you're teaching drums on Skype, is the hand positions, are they correct? How are the symbols being attacked? All real important and all things that Skype can't completely show you. Okay? Any more questions before this is done? One question. Oh, the teacher <laughs> asked a question. Since, All right. Since Randy was classically trained and you're yeah. doing classical music, if he was around, would you guys be making music together? We did one thing together, and this is because of sibling rivalry. Uh, truth be told, we didn't get along real well, okay? But we did write one song together. We wrote a song called Back to the Coast, which is on the first Quiet Riot record. And um, I've performed that song all over the world. I wrote the lyrics and Randy wrote the music. Did we do anything classical together? No, because when Randy was studying classical guitar, I hadn't really got full involved in classical piano yet. Remember, he passed in 82. I didn't really get heavily into doing classical piano and making arrangements and then in turn starting to produce records until after the year 2000. After the year 2000, I had kind of like an epiphany, okay? If you don't know what that means, then look it up today. I woke up one morning and I went, oh my God. God, I've been on the right highway, but I took the wrong exit. Why did I not see this sooner? And then from that day on, I devoted my life to writing classical music that is principally for the pianoforte. Okay? So, I didn't get that until I was a little older. But it's better to get it when you're older than not get it at all. I don't like to hear when people say I'm too old. They're not too old. We have a lady who studies piano. She started in her mid-70s. She really practices, and she's really good. She's really good. Didn't play piano before that. So it's never, never, never too old. That doesn't exist. Okay. Any more? Is that it? Okay. I don't know how you guys get along in the school with that girls. When I was going to high school, I went to school with them. So I give you a lot of credit for that. <laughs>